This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between two students about buying a used car. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now, let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello. Hello. Can I speak to Eleanor, please? This is Eleanor speaking. Hi. My name is Jan. I'm calling about the car that was advertised on the notice board in the Student Union building. Is it still for sale? Yes, it is. Your ad says it's a 1985 Celica, in good condition. It's old, but it has been well looked after. My family has had the car for 10 years. I'm just the third owner and my mother had it before me, so we know its history. We've got all the receipts and records. It's had regular maintenance and the brakes were done last year. It runs really well but looks its age. Why are you selling it, by the way? Well, I'm going overseas next month to study. I'll be away for at least two years, so I have to sell it, unfortunately. It's been a good car. You want $1,500, is that right? I was asking $2,000, but since I need to sell it quickly, I've reduced the price. Would you like to come and take it for a drive? I don't live far from the university. Yes, I'd like to have a look. What time would suit you? Any time this evening is fine. Um, well, I finish classes at 6 o'clock. How about straight after that? Say, 6.30? Great, I'll give you directions. When you leave the main gate of the university, turn left on South Road and keep going until you get to the Grand Cinema. Take the first right. That's Princess Street. I'm at number 88 on the right. So it's 80 Princess Street? No, it's 88 Princess Street and the suburb is Parkwood. You'll see the car parked in front. It's the red one with the for sale sign on it. OK. Thanks, Eleanor. I'll see you later. Bye. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Later that day, at the university, Jan meets up with her friend Sam and tells him about the car. Hi Sam. Hey Jan, what's happening? I'm glad I ran into you. I've decided I have to get a car. You're going to buy a car? Do you really need one? I'd probably still be driving except that my car broke down last year. Instead of getting another one, I just moved closer to the university and went back to riding a bike. Better for the environment, better for my health, and I save a lot of money. Did it really cost that much? 
Well, when you think of registration, insurance, rising petrol costs, parking, plus maintenance and repairs, it adds up. Mm, I know it's going to be expensive, but I really need my own transportation. It takes half an hour by bus each way to university as it is. But now I'm working at night in the city. There's no way I want to hang around waiting for a bus late at night, then walk three blocks home alone. Hey, I think you've got a point there. So what kind of car are you looking at? It's an 85 Celica. Same kind as I used to have. The owner's asking $1,500. That's pretty old. How many kilometres has it done? You know... I forgot to ask. I'll have to check tonight when I go to see it. Would you be able to come with me to have a look at about 6.30? Sure, I'll come, but I don't know a lot about cars. I do know one thing, though. I wouldn't buy an old car without having a mechanic look at it first. That's a good idea. But won't it cost a lot? Not really. You can get a check done through the Automobile Association for $80 and it comes with a report on the condition of the car. It can save you a lot of money in the long run. I'll keep that in mind. So we have to get to Parkwood at 6.30. Do you want to take the bus? It goes straight down South Road every 15 minutes. Or maybe we could walk. I don't think it's that far. Actually... I could borrow my roommate's motorbike for an hour or so. He's working all evening in the library. Do you think he'd mind? No way. He owes me a favour or two. OK, great. See you at six, outside the student centre. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a talk on local radio about a short film festival in the town of Adborn. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Today we're pleased to have on the show Fatima Johnson, who is the organiser of the Adborn Film Festival. Welcome, Fatima. Hello. Can you tell us a bit about the background to the festival and what it brings to the town? Well, the festival was started in 1996 by the then mayor of Adborn, Joanne Smith. She wasn't a filmmaker herself. She'd actually been a very energetic tourism development officer for many years. But Adborn had run a classical music festival, which had been becoming less and less popular in recent years. Joanne was looking around for something to replace it and to use funds allocated to it to promote something which local people can enjoy. <laughs> Great. So, tell us about the festival nowadays. 
Well, it's held in the last two weeks of August every year, and short films from all over the world are shown in three places, uh, in the theatre and our two cinemas. Several films are shown in one performance, and the whole thing lasts about 90 minutes. Tickets are very reasonably priced. Under 12s used to get in for 50p, but now we charge just £1, which is still very good value. £1.50 for students and £2.50 for everyone else. Performances are advertised all round town and also on our website, www.adbornfest.com. If you're interested in attending any performance, you can buy tickets online, of course, and you can also get them in the library, which is right next to the main shopping area. I'm afraid this year tickets are no longer available from either of the two cinemas because of restricted opening times. Uh, I understand you also run a film competition? Yes, for under-18s. We have a different theme every year. Last year, for example, the theme was Future Planet, and the winner was a ten-minute documentary encouraging youngsters to be more aware of environmental issues, focusing on getting school kids to cycle to school instead of going by car. This year, the theme is Sporting Nation, so there'll also be lots of ideas to choose from. Now, we're always on the lookout for new local talent, so if you live in the Adborn area and are under 18, you should have a go. We have an excellent prize every year donated by local businesses, shops, hotels, etc. This year, you can win a high-spec movie camera worth over £800. Application forms are on the website, and the deadline for sending in your film to enter the competition is the last day of July. It's May now, so you'll have the whole of June to be working on it. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. And what are the judges looking for? Well, although we choose very topical issues like the environment, we're not looking for propaganda, you know, trying to get people to do something. <laughs> Instead, we're looking for a new angle, a fresh way of looking at a theme. And of course, because it's a short film festival, it's not really about a fully worked story with well-rounded characters. It's more about good photography, conveying things visually. Mm. And who judges the films? A panel of three people who know a lot about film. We've used the same judges for many years and we're very happy with their expertise. One thing we probably will change next year, though, is we want to add another class and another prize for older filmmakers. We'll keep it at a maximum of ten minutes, though. The length works well for our festival. We also want to use different venues for the film shows, such as community centres and at least one school. It might make performances more accessible to a wider audience. We did explore the possibility of having late-night showings, but that's unlikely to happen in the coming year. So, as I say, if anyone's interested in submitting a film for our competition, go on to our website and you'll be able to access everything...
That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two geography students talking. An older student, called Howard, is giving advice to a younger student, called Joanne, on writing her dissertation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, Howard. I haven't seen you for a while. Hi, Joanne. Yeah, they're keeping us really busy on the postgraduate programme. Mm -hmm. But how are you? You'll be starting your dissertation soon, won't you? Yeah, tutorials start next week. I've got Dr Peterson. You'll remember it all from last year, of course. Oh, it's not something you forget easily. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, although I didn't expect to enjoy writing my dissertation, and in fact I didn't really find it much fun, mm. I wouldn't have missed the experience. I found it really improved my understanding of the whole degree programme, you know, from the first year on. Right. So what are you doing yours on? Glaciated Landscapes. Although I haven't decided exactly what aspect yet. Mm, I did mine on climate systems, so I can't help you much, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be fine once you start your tutorials. Dr Peterson will help you focus. I know, and he'll set me deadlines for the different stages, which is what I need. My concern is that I've got tons of material on the topic and I won't be able to stick to the word limit, you know. Mm, I remember I had different concerns when I was doing my dissertation. Last year? Yeah, before my first tutorial, I did a lot of fairly general reading because I hadn't fixed on my topic at that stage. Mm. I actually enjoyed that quite a lot and really improved my reading speed, you know, so I was getting through a lot of material. I was frightened I wouldn't remember it all, though, so I got into the habit of making very detailed notes. So, did you find your tutor helpful in getting you started? Yeah, we certainly had some interesting discussions, but it's funny, I saw a brilliant programme about climate change, and it was that that really fired me up. Oh. It was talking about some recent research which seemed to contradict some of the articles I'd been reading. Mm. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So you say your tutorials start next week? Yeah. Well, the first month's crucial. You've got to meet your tutor and decide on your focus, but don't become too dependent on him. You know, don't see him every week, only when you want to check something. Right. 
Once you've got the focus, you've got to get reading.、Mm. It's helpful to look through the bibliographies for all the course modules relating to your topic, and get hold of any books you think you'll need. I haven't got much money. I mean, get the books from the library. Far better. And I suppose I should prepare a detailed outline of the chapters. Yeah, absolutely. But don't feel you have to follow it slavishly. It's meant to be flexible. Okay. Now I'm someone who likes to get writing quickly. I can't just sit and read for a month. <laughs> Not like me then. <laughs> <laughs> But if that's what suits you, you know your natural approach, then you really ought to start immediately and write the first chapter. Right. Now, Joanne, about the library,、mm. it's worthwhile getting on good terms with the staff. They aren't always helpful with undergraduates. I suppose they focus on postgrads more. <laughs> Maybe. But show them you're serious about wanting to do good work. And what if I can't find what I need? Well, there's interlibrary loans. Borrowing books from other libraries, but I've heard it isn't all that reliable.、Mm, you're right, but you probably won't need it anyway. Be positive. <laughs> the library is likely to have most things you need. And during the dissertation writing period, you can take out fifteen instead of the usual ten books. Should I look at previous year's dissertations? You can do, but I won't know which are the good ones. The library only keeps the best, and the staff can advise you. Are they willing to do that? Oh yeah. And I'm worried about getting journal articles from the electronic library. Well, have you tried to find any yet? No. Well, you should. It's really straightforward. That's obviously something I'll have to look into. Doctor Peterson will help. Yeah, I know I can go to him if I have any worries. Except he will be away in the second month.、Oh. It's the holidays. You should ask him what to do while he's away. Gosh, yeah, but I suppose I can get a lot of support from course mates. I know a couple of people who are thinking of doing the same topic as me. Take care. Collaboration can become dependency. I think you'd better see how that works out. What the people are like. You're probably right. About other reading, I suppose Dr. Peterson will recommend plenty of good articles to get me started. One thing I'd find out is what his attitude is to internet sources. Surely not in this day and age. I'd better get that sorted out right at the beginning. I would if I were you. And I've also got some questions about the research sections. How much time I should spend explaining the process? Well, I think that's up to you. You can see how it develops as you're writing. Okay. It's the same with things like time management. That's something a tutor can't really help you with. I agree. So, is there anything else you need me to go over? That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear part of a talk about research into learner persistence given by a university lecturer to her colleagues. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty on pages seven and eight.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My talk is about a research study I did over a period of five years on learner persistence, why some people stick at academic study better than others. As teachers, you will know that there is a tremendous variation in the learner's response to certain things. For example, a short period of illness might completely destabilize some students and cause them to give up their degree studies. Other learners might overcome tremendous difficulties to stay the course. I am particularly interested in this second group, who are the ones with learner persistence. What I decided to do was design a research study using a sample of my university's third-year undergraduate students, 295 in all, who obviously had already stayed the course pretty well. The sample was drawn from a range of ages, but there was deliberately a significant number of mature students, and all respondents were living at home in the local region. I wanted to have this element of consistency, not having some coming from outside the area and living in university accommodation. It should be noted, though, that there was significant variation in home background to reflect the variation in our student population. I designed questionnaires which were devised to elicit what their concerns had been as they started the course and what had sustained them throughout the three years. Findings from the first section indicated that their worries when they started varied from financial concerns, though this had not been as strong as I expected, to career prospects. But mature students with children tended to emphasize uncertainties about their relationship with them. The second section of my questionnaire looked at learner persistence under three main headings, social and environmental factors, other factors, and intrinsic or personal characteristics. I identified three levels of importance for each of these. At the first level, those points identified by participants as most important in learner persistence. For social factors, many respondents said how crucial it had been to have good support, though there was no one specific source. It could be family or friends. As regards other factors, students are heartened not so much by high grades, but by what they regard as success in study. And for personal characteristics, many respondents reported that they took pleasure in challenge and that this was regarded as very significant. At the second level of importance, in the first category, a sizable percentage talked about the fact that they had enjoyed themselves in school as an important social factor. In the second column, other factors, a number of people said that what was of most importance was decent health. This had a fairly strong influence on their persistence in their studies. And then under the heading of personal characteristics, there were quite a large percentage of respondents who mentioned they felt it was important to have lots of interests in their everyday lives. This gave them a depth and sense of perspective, which less persistent learners might lack. And then on to the third level. Under social factors, several respondents talked about good relationships with their tutors. For other factors, they mentioned lack or absence of any problems in their families. And finally, under column three, they identified an ability to juggle several roles, what we might call their capacity for multitasking. Now, these findings obviously helped inform the design of activities, as I mentioned. But in addition, a number of further recommendations emerged. Firstly, I propose that the department distributes questionnaires to first-year students to help get an idea of their maturity when starting the course. This is really our overriding concern. Secondly, I recommend we look into ways of offering induction courses for some selected students to allow them to take on the role of advisors. We think they are the best people to act in that role. This policy will make support much more accessible to our students. Thirdly, this help is often most needed in the evening and night when offices are closed 
And so we should set up online services instead of the more traditional telephone services. Research has shown that these services are actually more accessible to the majority of students. And finally, it is often important to be proactive. If students are not meeting deadlines, then someone should contact them rather than wait for them to come to us. Now, are there any questions about the points... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.